On this episode, my co-host Normal and I are joined by our guests from Daytona.io to release their new open source developer environment management tool. Daytona is a CLI for creating and managing developer environments, similar to the way GitHub Codespaces works. But Daytona is fully open source and you can run it against your local machine or against a remote server or a cloud provider. We're joined by Ivan Burizin, the co-founder and CEO of Daytona, and Chad Metcalf, the head of strategy and alliances for Daytona, to discuss their launch of the Daytona project and to get a demo. This is an edited version of our weekly YouTube live show that you can join and ask our guest questions on Thursdays at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern at brett.live. So please enjoy this episode with Daytona. Hello, we got Chad Metcalf, prior of so many companies, including Docker, where some of us met him. Uh, he is head of strategy and alliances. Sounds like a really yeah. important job. <laughs> it's, be- it's basically just a good, it's a nicer way of saying better together storyteller. Yeah, I awesome. like it. I love storytelling and that's what we try to do here. We got Evan Burrison, the CEO and co-founder of Daytona. I practiced that name, but I still messed it up. I did conferences in a former life and emceed a lot. And I repeated people's names multiple times behind behind stages and I come on stage and I mess it up. So it's all good. <laughs> yeah, there's something about the, you know, the tunnel effect of when you're on stage that suddenly all that practice and rehearsal doesn't matter. So I wanted to mention real quick, cause it's not in the notes and it's not on our plan, but when we first met weeks ago, we were talking about this old school code programming startup that you had that people may have heard of. Code Anywhere? Yes, Code Anywhere. So Code Anywhere started in 2009. So same founding team. And so we wanted to solve software development back then. And we were super early and we built so many things. We built like four versions or five versions of the IDE, the web-based IDE, our own orchestrators, container, like all these different things that we built that didn't exist, which we take for granted today. So, but it was a great ride. It still sort of exists. People still use it. And I'm always surprised when I talk to people that they actually know of code anywhere more than anything else that I've done. So I think that's super <laughs> odd. Well, it's been around a long time and it was very early days for, you know, web IDEs or doing anything remotely really other than like remote desktop, which is, a, I grew up with that. That's how everybody got to their uh, developer environments was remote desktop 20 years ago, 15 years ago, which people still do today. But uh, we've got this wonderful new world of tech. So I'm excited to get into it. So that's part of the origin story. Tell us what happened this week. Something, a little, little, little tiny something? A little bit, yeah. So we, just very, very short background. Uh, Daytona was founded in April of last year. So less than a year, so 11 months uh, now. And this time around, this time meaning like not Code Anywhere, but a new company, similar mission, but sort of different vision, different go to market, everything. Uh, we very much went top down, try to help enterprises out the gate. And we've been doing that fairly well, I think. But we still think that setting up development environments, and you mentioned it at the beginning, Brett, I mean, all of us are slightly older here. I remember when it was like super easy, you know, you fire up your computer, if you were lucky enough to have a laptop, you had a laptop, but they were probably this big. And you could just start coding and you could just like run yeah. what you coded. Like today is not that, like that doesn't exist today, right? And so why has it become more and more complex? And can we solve this for large enterprises, but not for the individual developer? So we tried to do that, or we're trying to do that. So the alpha version of the open source project Daytona came out yesterday. And I feel it went well. I'm happy to have like, you all have seen a bit of what happened on the internet. So I'm like super excited that people are excited about it. That's awesome. Congratulations on yeah. launching that and, and open source. And I, I think for folks that are not in the know of or have never gone through launching something open source might underestimate how monumental of an effort that is to pull off. So first of all, heart, well, excitement and congratulations to that because it's not easy. Thank you. We yeah. haven't slept probably like for the last 10 days at all. So still very tired. If I don't look at it, it's just like lighting that I bought just for this podcast. So uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Red Bull stacked in the corner. Oh, yep. no, monsters, the white ones. <laughs> <laughs> Six of those a day will kill you. So make sure you only drink five. Exactly. Exactly. So Daytona, okay. So you existed before this open source. I remember your website had like a little sort of a beta invite form. What, what's been happening up until now? Like, have you been doing this in secret? What's been going on? 
Oh, so yeah, uh, yes and no. So not secret, like we've been out there, but the you couldn't have gotten to the product without booking basically a call. Out the gate, when we started building Daytona, we already had design partners that people sort of met us through our knowledge or history of Code Anywhere and sort of asked, oh, can you solve this and this problem? And so the problem is basically the ability to spin up and manage development environments in a secure fashion uh, for these large enterprises. So when you think of Daytona Enterprise, the enterprise product, it basically has three layers, right? So the top layer is the application security layer where like CISOs and everyone is sort of very interested in who can do what and where is the source code stored. The second layer is on the infrastructure. So you help out DevOps teams in the sense of like all the spinning up and spinning down of these development environments and making sure they're cost effective, that they work, that they run. And at the end is the developer experience. So we try to get that sort of code spaces, one click, one command sort of magic sort of to bring us back in time in that sense. It's like, oh, I want to code. It's just like hit one button and, you know, you start coding. And so basically we pulled out that developer experience part as its own product mm -hmm. and open sourced mm -hmm. that and hopefully, you know, give it to the world in the hopes that it will help people spin up their development environments. And so people think about this before. So sort of people think about this as like a web-based ID. It's not it, it's not a cloud. Even it's basically with Daytona, the vision is, and there are some things still missing. Vision is you type one command, Daytona create, you point to a Git repository and you point to a target. A target can be your local machine, your home lab that you have, a you know DigitalOcean droplet, you know Amazon, whatever. And then Daytona goes out it spins up that infrastructure, it injects the repository, it connects it to your favorite ID, be it local, JetBrains, VS Code, a web-based ID, whatever, creates a VPN tunnel, adds a reverse proxy that you can share with people. And so it does all these little things that when you're setting up the dev development environment, we actually wrote an article about this. It's like eight steps, it'll take you. If you're really good, it'll take you 15 minutes. Most people are not really good. I'm not that good. Yeah. It took me like 45 to get it up and running, right? And there's errors. And versus that, it's like one click, 30 seconds, and you're done. So long answer to your short question. No, that's good. Yeah, so the value proposition is accelerating developer engagement and onboarding within a team, within a project, if they're brought in to, to tackle some new items. Is it like providing that, that canned environment as quickly as possible so that you can get to new code, new features, development as fast as possible? It's on the edge of what the developer gets and what the business gets. So like the business, and actually I think that's why the open source is kind of very useful. The value that the individual developer gets is different than the value the business gets. And so the product, the thing that we sell is focused on the business value. And that is, that's a commercial product that we sell. But we also want every developer to have a fantastic experience and to, you know, not be bound to a trial tier or a spinning meter. And so like, let's give them that also make it easier. So the, you know, Daytona, Daytona enterprise is a relatively large enterprise application, it's got Kubernetes. It's got a bunch of stuff. It's heft, <laughs> it's hefty. And the, you know, the Daytona, the open source is a binary that has a server component that you can run, you know, on your laptop or on a, on your home lab. I've got a Linux box back there that I run it on. And I think the goals there are separate for individual developers versus teams and companies. So uh, should we like get into seeing what this is all about? Since you, you spent so much time getting it to, to open yeah. source, should we go right into showing what it looks like? Sure, if you want to. I mean, we'll have to pray to the demo gods that it works. I've rehearsed it, it worked every time, but you never know. So yeah, I'm happy to run through a sort of really quick demo. So. When you install Daytona, you basically get a CLI. There's no UI right now other than the, the CLI, but it's fairly simple. So to get started, you type Daytona create. I'll just add that right here. I've connected my GitHub account. You can connect your GitLab or Bitbucket, wherever you want, or you can enter a custom URL that you have access to. I'll just hit GitHub, personal, and you know companies there as well. And I'll just pick one, this TypeScript application. And we should be off to the races. Let's just change the name, uh, sample TypeScript. And so this is what I meant by target. So I have configured it 
Um, we have Docker as a provider right now. And so it can spin it up locally or it can spin it up on a digital ocean in Amsterdam. I'm currently in Europe. And so I spun it up on in Amsterdam just to make it faster. And so now for this demo, I'll do it local and now I'll switch over to digital ocean. So local, it'll start creating the workspace and it should do everything automatically after that. So let's see if that happens. I was gonna I was gonna talk about so this this is all running locally, right? Yes. Okay. And when you do it locally, you're it's in Docker? Yes, that's right. So we're gonna show inside this demo also has a dev container built inside of it. So it has a dev container file. Dev container is a specification from Microsoft that's built into everything. It's built into VS Code, JetBrains has it, it's built into code spaces, but it defines what your what a container for development looks like and potentially does some additional automation around the work, the life cycle of that. So when the container starts, do this. And when the container is updated, do that. And when the user attaches, do this. But you don't need that. So by default, we also just bring sort of a default container that's kind of a kitchen sink container that has a bunch of different tools and, and bits in there. But you can also override that and specify any sort of base image that you want to use. And then when you hit create, it just depends on are you, if there's a dev container there, we're going to use the dev container. Otherwise, we'll use whatever your base is and we'll give you that environment. And it'll feel local even if it is remote. And I think that was also part of it is, you know, there's lots of like, everybody should move to the cloud. Well, maybe. I mean, if that's valuable to you, then you should. If it's not valuable to you and you've got a laptop or a, you know, I've got a big desktop, like you should do that. But what's most, I think what's most important is that you shouldn't have to do two different things just because you want to use one place or the other. You should have the same workflow. Yeah, so this is the, the application that's running. Yvonne, if you want to just, zoom into that dev container, we can just sort of show for this particular application, which just happens to be a simple node. It's the Astro um, example app with um, Tailwind enabled. But you can see in here, maybe you zoom in a little bit, it has, a, it has an image and we just happen to be using the, the images from Microsoft. I think you know, Microsoft has a great wealth of content and they've got a community around dev container and I think it's fantastic that uses this sort of base TypeScript. Um, interestingly, we use the Bookworm variant of that because it runs in either x86 or ARM, which means that even you could take this example and run it on your Mac M1, M2, whatever, with VS Code, and it'll still work. It, if you take this example and run it in code spaces, it'll work. It'll, and I think that's the other value is that this thing will work no matter where you run it. But the other thing that, you know, these sort of extra goodies, I think, is what is sort of awesome about the full automations, the post create and the post start so that you can automate not just what's in the box, but the whole workflow and life cycle and automatically open the preview for me. And, and then it gets to that sort of that normal we were talking about earlier, the, the onboarding experience of like, it's not valuable for you on day one to know all the things. It is valuable for right. you to be up and running. And so right. yeah. the other pit is this is all in code. So on day two, you can learn it and then mm -hmm. you can do whatever you need. But on day one, you just click a button and you can type. So let me show you just a few more things. So basically I had one command. This project had a dev container, which had everything pre-installed. So it created a Docker container on my machine. It checked out the repo. It connected to my VS Code. It did the it added the SSH key. It then spun up everything in the dev container and it proxied everything to localhost, right? So that's there. Just little other things I can show you. If I want to change, if I want to use a, like a web ID, if I really want to, it's there as well. So then I, I changed it to a browser right now and I hit Daytona code and I spin this up. It'll download VS Code server on that container and it'll spin it up and open it in a second. Here it is. And so you have a browser-based editor if you really want it. I don't prefer it. Probably it could be my whole life being inside of cloud IDs for like, you know, 15 years. So I stay away from them, but you know, people like them. So they're absolutely there. It's funny you say that because VS Code in the browser to me, when I first heard about it with Codespace, I thought, I'm never going to do that. And now I do it a lot. Like, 
especially when I'm doing, yeah, yeah. you know, more than one line changes on a repo that I don't have locally and I don't want to bother with, like yeah. VS Code in the browser, even just that little pro tip in, in github.com where you hit the, I think it's the dot on your keyboard and auto opens up the editor. I thought, ah, I'm never going to do that. I do it all the time now. So it's amazing how, you know, you had it yeah. right the first time with code anywhere. Absolutely. What I was going to say is like choosing targets oh, so you can create I, new I, ones. I, I'm not going to do one right now. Sorry, go ahead. I think it's just use the tool that you want to in the moment that you need it and you're probably going to switch, right? So like I also use Vim for like a two minute thing. So with this, you can Daytona SSH and just use your, you know, if you just need to make a quick change or if you're going to be on your iPad, then use the web IDE. And if you've got JetBrains installed because you're doing a Java project and you want to use IntelliJ, then do that. And you can do all of those things and you don't have to, you don't have to decide. Yeah. So targets are like destinations where you'll spin up workspaces. And so right now, the only provider we have is a Docker provider. So it can be local or on a remote machine. I can put in my IP address of whatever the machine is, the password, or I can use a key and it'll connect that. Uh, it'll add that to the list. And then when I'm creating, I can pick where I want it to be. Upcoming, so TBD is providers for all large cloud hostings. So basically you can add credentials in there and it'll go out for, if you look at AWS, for example, it will go out to create an EC2 instance and then do everything for you. And then when you delete the workspace, it'll delete the EC2 instance for you. It'll do that all sort of automatically for you there. I just did that just to show you. And so let me try to create one on, I'll do a custom URL. So like any URL you have access to will also work very well. This is just like another hello world one. It'll ask for a default name. I'll just put this. And so I'll, this time I'll pick for my DigitalOcean just for the sake of spinning it up on DigitalOcean. And it'll go off and do the same sort of creation method. It might take a second longer, maybe the same, depending just latencies. But latencies, that's why you usually when you're doing remote, you try to give it in the same sort of place in the world that you are. So it's actually pretty fast, I think. Yeah. And so it'll also do the same thing. So it'll open a workspace. It'll make everything, proxy everything to localhost. So it'll feel like localhost, like you're working localhost. For this project specifically, I have to do yarn, yarn start, yarn start. And it's on port 2000, but I want to do, so I just don't type it wrong. I'm copying and pasting here. If I do a new terminal here and I type port forward 3000 public, I should get a public URL that you guys can all check out. Here it is. So. Here it is. I can't share it with you, but if you type this in, you should be able to preview the world. Try Daytona app, and it'll give you some sort of URL. So basically, even if it's behind the firewall, if it's anywhere, I can share someone, you know, my PM, my you know, manager, my teammate, whatever, whatever I'm doing live without having to set up everything, without making it public, without, you know, pushing it to a staging environment, without anything directly from your local host, you can send it and share it to people. And this is where we're talking about the code spaces like experience. Like you'll be able to have, like it doesn't exist quite yet because we wanted to get it out and get it into the open so that everybody could participate and develop in the open and all of that. But you know, you'll have an extension that you can install that you say, hey, on GitHub, I'd like to have a, a button that says Daytona. And when you click it, it, it will know to send it to the target that you want to. And I think one way to think about targets for the Docker community is kind of like Docker host. When you, when we, when, you know, when sort of the beginning of Docker, like mm -hmm. if you think about Docker machine days where you would have different remote Docker hosts and you would just change the Docker host environment variable and throw a container to a remote box. It's the thing about targets very much like that. Like there is an engine somewhere that's running for you. We call it a server and it's going to take the workload and it's going to breathe life into it and make it available. And then we plumb the rest of that connection so that you don't have to know where it runs and where it lives because in the end, it's just a container. So can you quickly step through all the things that when you did that Daytona create, can you just step through really quickly, like what it's doing, right? Like all those steps that it's doing. Sure. That's automating. Sure. Happened so fast. I don't think people realize like how much work is actually being done behind the scenes. Which is great. <laughs> Which is great that you see that it's happened so fast. So basically what it does, <laughs> be it the local or be it on DigitalOcean, it basically said, okay, I'm creating a workspace. So for what we're using right now, we're using Docker as a provisioner, but it doesn't have to be Docker in the future. We can use other things. And so it'll spin up a Docker container, right? And so, oh, it's sp spun that up. And now 
in that Docker container, it's checked out the repository. And then once it's checked out the repository, it will then go and depending, if, let's say for example, my local VS code, it'll spin up my local VS code and actually authenticate with my local VS code. So it actually has access to that workspace, right? It'll then, it will read through the repository if there's anything there after it's checked it out. If there's like a dev container or whatever, it'll run through that and build that dev container. It does a VPN tunnel for remote to the workspace. So you have access not only through SSH, but you have all the ports accessible to you. And so it also makes it super secure. And then it adds a reverse proxy. Right now it uses the Daytona uh, URL so that you can share all these things with other people. And we actually wrote a, I'm going to show this right here. We wrote it, you get to take a look at that DIY guide for all of this. And it runs you through all the steps that, you know, you as a person, if you wanted this experience, would have to do. And it takes quite a bit of time. And so all of these things that I'm scrolling through right now really fast is what Daytona does in those 30 seconds that you saw right there. That's an article? Yeah, it's a 5,000 word article. DIY. Oh, is it the DIY guide to transform any machine into code? Yeah, yeah, got it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right, we have some questions. Why choose Daytona over DevPod? Oh, so the, I mean, why, why? Well, I think DevPod, to be perfectly honest, does a really good job. So totally honest with that, the way they're doing it, the way they think about it. They do a full UI as well. The way we wanted to package it was as small as possible and do that as a CLI. And both of them are completely open source and free to use and real open source. So I think that's great and that, that the industry has a choice on who they want to choose. And really with this project, what we're doing is trying to help developers out there, right? So this project specifically is not connected to our revenue streams or to our customers or whatever. That, as we mentioned, is a completely different uh, product. So hopefully both products out there actually help this idea or problem move forward in the sense that it doesn't have to be a pain to set up development environments. So that would be my completely honest answer. Right. The collaboration bit, I think, is different. So the, uh, the port sharing that goes out to a URL that you can share amongst people. Also, one thing that I'm really excited about is Daytona has a plugin architecture. So right now the plugins are provider plugins and there's the, you know, so there'll be DigitalOcean and there'll be Docker, there'll be, you know, cloud providers, but it's also open-ended so that much like the old days of Docker machine, I'm sure some people are going to come up with some pretty wild ways of interacting with dev container or, you know, other bits with inside the extensibility bit, I think is going to be slightly different because it has a, it's been a, it's, since it's open source and it's also pluggable, like, you know, if somebody wants to bring a different file format, so, you know, maybe Nix or something instead of dev container, like that's totally possible within the framework and it's actually part of the design. So, I mean, I think, you know, the other bit we'll see is just the community will tell us what is cool and neat and just expands it. So I think that would be a place where things get really different. To double down on that, so we've mentioned a lot of Docker and Dev Container, and that's absolutely what we chose starting off. But the way that it's architected and the way we plan, and it's in our roadmap on the reunion as well. So as Chad said, so Nix and DevFile and Flux and all these other standards are definitely on our roadmap to be there. So we don't want to be the ones that choose which standard you use. We just want to help people have a standard. That's a great yeah. segue to where do you think, so what are you looking forward to? That you've just open sourced it. What's the roadmap look like? Or where is it going to be? You know, if we come ping you again in six months, a year from now, where do you want Daytona to be? Where do you want this to be? So from a technological perspective, it's mostly about uh, all these extensions and plugins so that every cloud provider, not just the big three that like are in there. So no matter what you're using as a user, you don't have to like install anything. It's just like add my credentials and like Daytona does all this magic there. So you want that. Also the, the standard, the support for the dev environment is code standards. So dev file, Nix, Flux, all these definitely want that in there. And hopefully the community as a whole or the world as a whole actually adopts dev environment as code as a way of work. I'm seeing, at least in the conversations I'm having, a lot more large companies moving forward to this, but I'm not sure that, I still don't feel that the majority of people have embraced it, which is which makes just everyone's life easier if you do. And this is not a Daytona thing. This has nothing to do with Daytona. It's just a way of work, which I think just makes everyone's life easier. It's actually remind that this part of the discussion is actually reminding me of 
well, over a decade ago when I first learned about sharing out your dot files on GitHub. And it two things that we're, we're sort of exposing it's is that I would watch people streaming, twitching, whatever, and I'd see their setup and I was like, wow, that's a really cool shell. I get all kinds of questions about shells. And that they would have a dot files directory on their GitHub or a repo rather. And then the second thing was that they're you could kind of tell what all the tools they were using by the things they were sharing in dot files. So I almost feel like your vision here for talking about, you know, dev environment as code. I was trying to actually in the lose this week, come up with an acronym or a way for us to describe this sort of personal developer environment setup, because we had this word for IDs. We've had it for 30 years, right? And it, it actually means something different than it used to. Like 20 years ago, you would install Visual Studio and it would do everything. It would have every tool, all the things no. you needed. If you needed a third-party tool, it was usually a plug-in that you had to pay for, and you would plug it into Visual Studio, and you were done. But now, I, you know, the, the best I've come up with for my own environment is a shell script that, that I even tried to make Mac and Linux agnostic, which is a, a lot of work, right? So that I can set up yep. NeoVim and all my shell plugins, my old, my ZSH, and put in the GitHub command line amongst Docker and a thousand other things, all just so that you can yeah. dev there, whether that's through a shell or through an IDE or a web browser, it's it's a lot. And I, I'm actually really excited about this idea. Like what could, where does this go next where I end up sharing out not just my VS Code plugin list, which I started to add that into repos, right? So VS Code will automatically mm -hmm. install extensions based on your, your repos mm -hmm. recommendations for extensions in VS Code, which I think that's very powerful. It reminds me of editor config and some other things. But mm -hmm. I'm just trying to imagine this where you have this sweet setup and you're showing off VS Code in your browser and your local dev environment and all the dev tooling. And you can share that out in a, a repo or a single YAML file. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of like where your vision's going, where you want to see my dev setup that I just showed on the live stream? Here's a single file or here's mm -hmm. a repo and it has everything you need and it's two, one or two commands and you're, and you're golden. Absolutely. I also want to add is that what you said with naming, like we don't have a name for what this is. So yeah. when you think about it, there's different names, right? Cloud ID, that's not this, like cloud development environments, that sort of Im implies that it's cloud only where this is like local right. or cloud or just like a remote mm -hmm. box, right? So it's like anywhere. And also, so like, it's been very confusing. We call it develop environment manager. That's the best we could have come up with. i um, not saying it's the best, it's just like the best <laughs> we did. Because the and people aren't understanding it until you tell them, oh, it's like a code spaces experience that runs local and remote. I'm like, yes. Oh, that's awesome. Like, I haven't thought about that. And so that is definitely where we're going. And what you call that automation that is done, which you're talking about, Brett, is like, oh, can I yeah. share that setup of automation with yeah. someone else? So we don't have a better name than DEM or Developer Environment Manager for now. If you have better ones, I'm open absolutely to change it. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to suggest <laughs> DevStack was the only thing I came. I actually did like research for hours the other night because I was okay. want to talk about this more extensively in the newsletter this week, and I realized yeah. DevStack is probably the most universal thing I could come up with because we have tech stacks. We all talk about like server tech stacks, sure. and there's I think like techstacks.io yeah. or something. There's a, references to it all over the place. And then I thought about like if, if IDE is now just the editor, we used to think of that as the entire environment, integrated developer environment. It used to be the whole thing. Now it's really just the editor. Is it PDE? I was trying to make sure I didn't clash on acronyms, but like personal developer environment. Like, how do I, how do I felt like, okay, that's too, that sounds too business and corporate -y. I don't even know if I mm -hmm. want an acronym. So maybe, maybe yeah. DevStack is like, like your tool could be that environment manager, but maybe I don't, you know, maybe I'm someone who doesn't need a development. Anyway, we're down a rabbit hole of naming things, which is hard and we can spend a whole hour on it. Yeah. But this is definitely but an interesting trend. I like the idea of being able to describe and share my various setups not just the mm -hmm. repo, but everything else that comes with it. We kind of have a little bit of that with the dev container standard, which we haven't talked too much about, but the dev containers has kind of taken off as sort of a way to yeah. develop in, inside containers. I think you're using that out of the box, right? That's part of your your standard. Yep. Yeah. It's an option for sure. Yeah. And you can do exactly what you were talking about, where if you say like, I want these VS Code extensions that can go in the dev container, like you can specify it quite a lot. And I think... The other part, Brett, where this gets really complicated is the things that you bring as an individual versus the things that your team needs as like consistent mm -hmm. across the team, right? So like, hey, the version of 
whatever framework we're using, that's that has to be consistent. Like I need you all in the same spot versus if you want to use this editor or that editor I, or, you know, this shell, that shell, I don't care. So, I mean, how do you keep that consistency across teams and then let developers have their individuality for the tools that they use? An additional thing that comes out of that is as we're inter- interacting with more complex deployment systems, right, with like Kubernetes and complex cloud architecture and different services, I think we also assume, and I, I know I'm guilty of this, that we assume that folks know a certain set of tools that's implied with the things that we're talking about, right? And so like, if we're talking Kubernetes, I probably will assume that you know what Helm is or what Kube, KubeCuddle is or what or XYZ tooling that's kind of like the de facto standard or what most people use. And I think a lot of that gets hidden and we don't really talk about it, but it's assumed. And that's where a lot of the friction occurs with folks that are entering in or switching to a new environment. And I, I think that's also the reason why Nix is getting a little bit more popular is like this idea of capturing the whole entire development environment, this new developer experience as a, not only as components stitched together, but also as this re- reproducible instance, right? This reproducible environment that, you know, someone like Brett can hand over to someone like myself and say, here, here's all my tools, here's my themes, here's my extensions, here's how I use these things. And this is what I'm assuming when I'm trying to educate you, Normal, on the latest Kubernetes feature or something like that, right? And so you're right, there needs to be a term for this because we're seeing a lot of focus on this area and like there's a lot of new stuff coming out in this space for sure. Yeah, I think you said it really well with the assumptions. So I'll tell you, when we were trying to build this, and we were working with our team internally, all super smart engineers, like kudos to them. And then they, the first interface was like, okay, this is what you need to do to create a development environment. I'm like, this is not easy. And they're like, sure it is. Here you go. You just do this, 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 and this. Are you talking about a 10 page word document? Is that what you're talking about? Like old school days? Yeah, yeah no, it's not, but it's like, it's like yeah. super, and I show you, it's like, I'm like, no, like the whole yeah. thing. And so what you're saying with Nix and Dev Container, I've, I put them sort of in the same bucket, there are different technologies and different ways of doing things, but in the way they standardize the development environment, which I think is great, they take away a lot of the friction, but you still have errors if you look at works on the machine sort of problem is like, oh, can it work on this hardware and this hardware or whatever? And we want, what we're doing is sort of wrapping a wrapper around that and sort of making it that it's just one single command and everything is done. And so not in the sense of deleting it. So you as a experienced engineer, can still see everything on their hood. You can change it, you can do it. But as someone that for me, like if I don't care or I'm just new or just have to fix this little thing, just make it work. And that's sort of what we want. And that's that's how I think this sort of all aligns together. And I see the industry going in that direction. It's also good for just open source or like company inner source, right? Like if I see a little problem and I go to fix it and it takes me 10 minutes to get the environment up, I might just bounce, right? I, it's like, okay, that's too much work and I, I need to get a bunch of stuff done and, and I just don't have time versus if I can hit a button, get an environment, make a quick change and then feel successful in that contribution, then I can be encouraged or incentivized to make those changes and to help versus like, I want to help, but I, I don't have half an hour to figure out how to make this thing work and do it the right way. And so I'm going to bounce. I think that you see a lot of that. And, and hopefully yeah. a lot of it is just like focus on what matters. Yep. I totally 100% agree. I recall a customer where this was a little while ago, but still very relevant today. It was a C-suite CTO. And they mentioned that they they weren't like a tech forward company, but they had spent all this effort finding top tier developers, getting, you know, getting them to come take a job with them at their company. And the first day they they show up at the job, they get their laptop and they they go to github.com and it's blocked. And then they, you know, they try to download VS Code and that's blocked. And, you know, they have to use putty or something else to like SSH into some bastion host. And they, not one, but multiple people the first day they were, you know, like they just got their badge, they got their onboarding, they just quit. They were just like, I'm done, yep. I'm out of here, right? And so they spent months trying to get these high-class 
developers trying to modernize their technology. And then their development environment just wasn't up to par and couldn't provide the tools. And so this was a little while ago, but like this is still the same. This happens all the time. And these kind of tools can help alleviate that friction and also get security and other areas of your organization bought in, right? So, hey, this is standardized. This is in this file. This is what's going on here. I mean, I think it goes, it reminds me a lot of the beginning of the Docker days, right? What, like, where do these things come from? Where do these containers come from? Where do these dev environments come from? And then if you can give a company the understanding and the governance and the control to say like, hey, we want to enable you. So here are, here's this Lego approach of like, you can do whatever you want so long as you use the Lego in our box, right? So these dev containers or these features or these things, anything you want to do, we know where these things come from. We trust them. They're also uniform across the company and there's a DevOps team that keeps them updated and up to snuff. And do you really care where what version of your Python comes from? Like probably not. Like you just want a version so that you can get your stuff done and get home. And you know, you'll see that and then you know, hopefully, yeah, you make that better. Then if we can remove some 400 millisecond latency stacks from people that have remote sort of desktop environments or whatever, then that all the better. Like, great. I think we should mention, if I'm, I'm correct in saying that Daytona for the open source project, it's a single binary, right? Like you're basically the install script just downloads a binary, throws it in your bin directory, and then you can, it, it runs in Docker. So you got to have that running. I, I made that little issue at first. I, I was not running Docker. And then it's like a, like you showed, it was a little wizard and I didn't have to read the readme to get started. Like I didn't need to absorb a bunch of documentation to get it going. And especially if you're familiar with code spaces or any other like remote developer, man, basically for VS Code, if you've done VS Code, you've done anything with a remote, this is going to just feel like right at home or you can choose to use the, the browser editor or your local VS Code. It's amazing actually how many students I get that, are using VS Code, but VS Code itself doesn't actually do a great job at telling you all of its remote capabilities through the extensions. Mm -hmm. So I, I regularly yep. run into people that are maybe in their first few months of VS Code, maybe they're coming from an old editor where they, they might have had some remote capabilities, but they were very limited or they were totally different. And how easy VS Code can be for just remoting into a container, remoting into another machine in your network, remoting into the cloud. It's kind of fantastic. And to those of us that are used to it, on the bottom bar, there's a bright blue bar, that bar that's telling you which environment that editor is looking at. And as someone who watches people code all the time, it's like, I always look for that little line to see, oh, are they developing locally? Are they in a dev container? Are they on a remote machine? Are they using a code space? What are they, you know, how, because we all, I think we all kind of look at cues for how people set up is when we're watching them work, right? We're all looking at the menu bar on Macs to see what apps are running. We're looking at VS Code to see what is it is copilots lighting up a bunch of stuff in there and we're all very curious i think about tooling because like daytona you know this is we are not done here in this space there's a lot of opportunity for improvement making it easier and now ai is just going crazy I, i'm curious i have a question do you see that okay. there's any ai components for daytona do you use anything yet or do you have a vision of the future of how gen ai because it's a topic for this year. We have to ask it every time we yep. have someone on the show. Absolutely. Because There's a couple of things that we can do with AI to make your experience better. So not your co-pilot or whatever, like that's already, I mean, done in that sense. But there are things that we can do. Not going to share too much about that, but they're definitely on our strategy for later this okay. year, just to make this experience better. So just what you said, Brett, is like, it took a lot of sharpening to get to the point where... I never read manuals, by the way. So I built this for yeah. me so that it's like, I don't want, and there's still some rough edges that I want to make a bit, a bit smoother. And so the idea is that everything that we can do to make it smoother and you have to know less to get up and running, but without deleting it. So like, you don't want to remove the complexity for the experienced people that want to do it. But if you just want to get up and running, it has to be super smooth. And so in that context, I think we can do a lot with AI to make it smoother. Okay. I'm looking for the AI think, that will do the project start. So yeah. like we have, we're talking about developer yeah. environment, but there's so much that goes into like, especially when we start, start talking about cloud native, this is my pitch. This is for Daytona V2. Um, is, okay, is, <laughs> listening. Is, we talked about in the show before, so Nermal's over there rolling his eyes at me, but like, well, if you think about it, if you're starting a new project, you need a YAML repo for your Kubernetes YAML if you're using Kubernetes. You need a repo that 
is probably your tooling repo that if you have, if you're doing microservices or anything other than a monolith, you've got a bunch of software repos and you usually need a tooling repo. That might be where your Docker code or your Docker compose runs or sits. And so you end up spending like the first two hours just setting up repos, cloning them locally, getting all my sample, like my dot Docker ignore, my git ignore, all, all the standard stuff that I need in the repo before I write a line of code. And I really just want an AI that looks at my GitHub, that sees how I do it, and looks at all the repos I have access to and be like, well, based on your in setup, I'm just gonna make the five repos that I request in the prompt. And this one's gonna be your Kubernetes YAML. This is gonna be your Argo C Git Ops deployment re re repo. And it just makes it all happen because there's so much, I feel like there's so much of that, especially when we're all writing smaller and smaller like microservices or medium services, whatever we want to call that middle nebulous area that I, I tend to operate in. And so I feel like this dev environment idea has, there's an opportunity there where it can maybe do a little more than just the environment itself. It's maybe your project set up, especially when you're starting something new. I see that, I see that a lot with the, the teams I work with and they end up with like template repos that inevitably get out of date yep. because it's, no one wants to update templates. No one wants to bother with that. That's You're not question. far off from what we were thinking. Just telling you, we're not far off <laughs> okay. from what we're thinking. But sure. I will add that in our train of thought, for sure. So it's definitely things to make your life easier. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I think you hit on one one key point, though. It has to be the way that you do it, because like every yeah. company is going to be different. Yeah. So that, mm -hmm. that thing has to be trained on the way, which is our way, because our way is very different than their way. Yep. And I think it'll be even more important to have dev environments in this space, because I think that with some amount of the, the gen AI, people will know less about the environment when the environments are actually just given to them by an AI who's like, oh, you wanted a project to do X, Y, and Z. Here's the project. Type the curly braces. Now, do you know where that environment came from? Do you know how it's running? Do you know where the tools inside of it came from? Maybe, maybe not. And hopefully that's trained on the way that you do it for the way. Yeah, and personal yeah. and work would probably be different, right? Like we're talking, if we're talking semantics personal here, work like will be different. Yeah, I, my personal projects have preferences, but the work projects are probably set by a team leader or some other team yeah. that is, yep. you know, in the ivory tower telling me what I need to do in my repos. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm looking forward so, to my my idea becoming envisioned <laughs> for your future project for the Brett bot that automatically makes your applications. Where do folks get started, and what should they do first? Our GitHub repo has everything there. Just a quick start. There's just like one command and you're up and running. And so if you actually want to read the readme, you can. But as Brett said, you probably don't have to. <laughs> and so that would be probably the place where we think it's best that people take a look. Obviously, website, documentation, Twitter, whatever. But the readme, we tried to condense everything you need just there so you don't have to go hopping around the internet. Cool. That's the installation. That's it. Awesome. And then what are some area, like one, one quick area where you would encourage folks to get involved if they want to get involved with the open source project? As Chad said, like the extensions, but Chad, feel free to take the mic. Yeah. It was pretty impressive. Within an hour of open sourcing, we had people who were offering to help with packaging. So, I mean, like right now, we, we are going to work on packaging so that it's in Brew, Brew. and Winget. Yeah. But we wanted to get out the door because yeah, at some point you just got to ship it. Certainly, I think that some people will enjoy working on the runtime, but my guess is that's going to be a smaller set of folks, just like any runtime project. Like there's a set of folks who enjoy that, but there's going to be a larger set who enjoy working on the content. So like dev container, things around dev container, like examples, documentation, there's lots of space for that. And also the plugin side where like right now we have dot files in Daytona Enterprise, but we don't have it in this yet, but that that could absolutely be a plugin where you know you specify what your dot file repo is, and then we inject it for you. I'm sure there's lots of examples that people will come up with some neat, some fun ideas that we haven't even begun to consider yet. Cool. Well, that's a great starting point for the folks that are listening, and we encourage you all to try it out. This new open source project. And it looks like there's no shortage of feature enhancement requests in the issues list. There's always an infinite amount of those, I imagine, in any open source. And if you want, they have a Slack, right? So you can join the community Slack. You can follow them on Twitter, request a feature, a bug report. And yeah, like they're saying, just a couple of commands, three. That's how many. I did have a, a third one in there, which was start Docker. Apparently that's not needed unless you yeah. are just doing it local. 
So yeah, it's, yeah. Cool. it's optional, but not for me. Yeah. And I talk to customers that, you know, their developers can't have Docker on their laptop because yeah. it, it's not allowed and within the security infrastructure. Well, great. Well, you can still get Daytona. You can still get that local like experience, but it's going to be you know, remote. And, you know, I think that's one of the cool things where like, if you need it local, run it local. If you need it remote, run it remote, but you shouldn't have to know the difference. Very nice. Well, thank you both for being here. Sorry, we have to wrap this up. We would probably just hang out for another hour and play with Daytona some more, but they got to get back to shipping because you got version uh, 1.1 to go. But thank you so much, Chad. And they're going to go and they're going to follow you on the socials. They're going to download this, the tool, and they're going to get started. What's the, what's about to ship? You just shipped it this week. Do you have any plans of like some new thing that's already in the works, but from one of these ideas, I'm like, I'm looking for the hot take right before we end. Oh, so uh, like the providers, the sense of target. So the major cloud hosting providers okay. and JetBrains as I mean, well. So that's probably in the next week, hopefully. Nice. Um, hopefully my engineering team doesn't kill us that it's like, so that'll be out um, as well. Yeah. That's what I look to do on the show. I always used to, I always want to anger some engineers that realize their CEO just committed them to work on a live stream. Yeah. It's only on the internet yeah. forever. So it's fine. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you too for being here. Cool. Thanks all. Bye, Bye. everybody. See ya. Bye. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.